For anyone that's been paying attention, it's been a really exciting year for the labor movement. Uh, we've had really massive contract campaigns at UPS in the UAW, but we've also had people taking action all over the country from all different kinds of locals. Uh, we have a speaker here from the waste department. We have a speaker from Coca-Cola. And we've seen contract campaigns and practice pickets and strikes all over the country within the Teamsters, from Cisco to U.S. Foods, DHL. Uh, TDU helped elect new leadership in the IBT with Sean O'Brien. And so we have new leadership now that's willing to support these kind of militant contract campaign actions and uh, extended picket lines and practice picket lines. But for TDU, we understand that all of this kind of stuff starts at the member level. None of this happens if members aren't ready to take action themselves. We have several speakers today from locals that are encouraging these kinds of actions. And we have several speakers from locals um, who the members kind of had to get started for themselves. So everyone on this call, we have something for you. Uh, we're gonna go through at the beginning and talk about the different stages of a contract campaign, different stages of bargaining. And then we're going to hear examples from different Teamsters and auto workers about how exactly they took this plan and put it into action. So first up, um, I'm going to pass it uh, to Nicholas Bedell. Nicholas Bedell is the administrative director uh, for the News Guild, um, a longtime friend of TDU. Thanks for being here, Nick. And Nick's going to talk about uh, contract campaigns. Thank you. You bet, everyone. Nice to see you uh, this afternoon on the East Coast and this morning on the West. Uh, I'm Nick Bedell. I'm the Administrative Director of the News Guild <laughs> CWA. It's a 25,000 uh, member sector of CWA, and we do a lot of contract campaigns and uh, new organizing so we're going to share some of the experiences that we've had over the last couple of years, building out robust uh, contract campaigns. So if you could take me to the next slide. We're going to get started for bargaining. And we, we set folks up to understand uh, the entering into collective bargaining with the employer as the employer's opportunity to uh, continue its anti-union campaign. If you're in a unit that has been under contract for a while, and this is an expiration, uh, they've been running a discipline campaign. They've been, you know, you've been in, aren't you know, sort of hand-to-hand -hand combat on the ground, and now we're into collective bargaining, and they're in a position to be particularly anti-union and particularly difficult. So we start off with the idea that bargaining is when you go to the table with a whole bunch of proposals, you're, you're looking to improve working conditions, things that make total sense to you. It's obvious they're the right thing to do. And the overwhelming answer you're going to get from management is no. This is how all bargaining starts. Then we move into what you actually can envision winning. And that is entirely based on the power that you build collectively. There is no world that an expert negotiator wins more at the table than a union well organized taking action and get collective action against the employer. So the UAW campaigns, the uh, UPS contract campaign were characterized by significant and impactful collective actions that move the needle in bargaining. And then a uh, maxim that appears to repeat itself over and over again is you spend a lot of time yapping at the table, everybody posturing, taking different positions, digging in, so on and so forth. And, and over time, you finally get to the point where you have produced a moment where there's a crisis for the employer where they are in a position to uh, envision some kind of settlement. The union is wet, ready, has set its targets and knows what it needs to achieve. And there is a rapid uh, set of a movement at the table and 90% of what you've been trying to move moves in the last 10 
percent of bargaining and that's the sort of most exciting moment when you're down to the wire and you're finally in a position to uh push the employer where you need to push them so if you could next slide so we we like to break the the bargaining up into stages because it's easier to understand and it also puts you in a position to prepare what you need for each one of the uh, moments that you're going to face as you move through the through the collective bargaining process and head towards a contract that you know makes significant improvements. First one, stage one, is you got to get prepared, figure out what your contract campaign are going to be and what the what your proposals are going to be, and figure out who's uh, handling the table negotiations and who's handling the organizing of the membership to be engaged in the fight from the beginning. So that's stage one. Then you're going to set the bargaining agenda. This is the place where you're at. You go to the table. And I like to think of collective bargaining as the union is calling the management to a investigatory slash discipline hearing. We have a set of uh, performance improvement goals for management, and they are our proposals. This is how you can do your job better. And so we brought you to the table to discipline you for not doing your job correctly and making some suggestions for how you could improve. And this is ultimately the improvement that is most important to members is that the democracy at the workplace and respect and uh, participation and voice of members on the ground in the terms and conditions of how they do their work every day. That's what we bring to the table as the agenda to uh, begin conversations about how management has screwed up. Uh, stage three is you've moved through workplace democracy, respect, fairness demands, and then you're going to uh, bring the economic package to the table. Uh, generally, there's been a lot of research, what's the company's possible, how the wages relate to, to the uh, cost of living in the area that you are, uh, whether or not uh, health benefits have been, you know, are, are reasonable, all of those economic pieces all together, uh, the union generally brings an economic package together and uh, puts those demands on the table. The end of stage three is characterized by everything's on the table and everything's talked about. Everybody knows where uh, the different pinch points are, what the must-haves for management are, what the must-haves for the union. And we have we move into stage four, which is the point at which we have organized enough collective power, enough collective action over time that we can put the company on their heels and experience a crisis that says that we that they have to move from yes I and mean, from no that they said at the beginning and have been saying all along to some form of yes and that is the moment uh that's the crisis moment uh so let's look a little bit more closely at the various stages to think about how we all can do this First one is we tend to divide responsibilities into collective actions and uh, direct table bargaining and electing a bargaining committee and a contract action team. And I would recommend that this relationship between these two groups begins to is robust and is set out in the beginning of your contract campaign before you ever get to the table. Because one of the real things that you want to avoid having happen is that the bargaining committee starts to go off into corners and hotel rooms and smoke cigars and make separate deals. And the membership doesn't know what the hell is going on. The absolute opposite of that is what is the most effective in showing the company that we're all unified together on these demands. And that's direct collective actions supermajority that show the company that we're all bought in on what the bargaining committee is telling them at the table. Next slide. So lots of ways to do this. Identify what your demands are. These are the priorities for membership. These are the, you know, the uncomfortable moments that they experience at work and want changed. Uh, they can be everything from, you know, uh, increased seniority protections, 
tighter just cause, better grievance procedures, uh, labor management committees that have some teeth, safety uh, enhancements in safety language and enforcement opportunities. So we're going to figure out what the what the concerns are of the membership writ large through a survey. I suggest that you often could do these in person, get teams together, really start talking about the issues and do proposal meetings so that you can emerge what it is that your members in this particular unit that you're bargaining are interested in seeing changed. Then you are going, you've defined them, you've figured out the priorities, and you're going to reflect those back to the members, popularizing them and making them something that people see their own concerns and their own uh, needs reflected in. And, and then we're going to organize some type of visible majority activity. This is a parking lot meeting with signs. This is a whole variety of ways in which you can do that. We at the News Guild, the first uh, we bargain mostly uh, on Zoom, and the first uh, bargaining session is almost always a open bargaining session that any member can come to. So, uh, next slide. So, CAT teams, right? They keep the group group meetings. These are people not on the bargaining committee. This is uh, keeping members informed about what's going on, and they plan and lead job actions in support of negotiations. All the simplest things, a button day, a t-shirt day, a this or a that, or anything that has a visual of majority support is extremely impactful against the employer and starts to build in the culture that everyone is fighting those contract demands at the table. It's just your representative at the table saying what you want them to say. And you're going to make it clear to management that this is what you want by a visible majority action across the board, repeating and escalating over time. Next slide. The bargaining committee itself, this is sort of the, the expertise mode a little bit. Uh, people get fascinated by table tactics. They really, really care about the, the idea of the expert negotiator. Uh, I would argue that there's less to it than having bargained probably 150 contracts. There's less expertise than you would think. Uh, it's much harder to negotiate with my family to figure out what restaurant to go to dinner than it is to figure out a table tactic. Uh, against an employer. They're not as smart as everybody thinks they are. The fact that they came with their fancy lawyer in a suit really doesn't mean anything. Everybody who's at that table knows the job, knows the concerns, and knows how to fight to win them. And that's what's going to get your bargaining committee moving the employer to where you need to be. They're, uh, they're, the conversation at the bargaining table is defined by the union. We called them to collective bargain. They didn't willingly say, oh, yes, we'd love to collectively bargain with you. We won an election years ago or just recently, and we said, you have to come and talk to this collective group, the union. And so we are calling them to the table. And if we call them to the table, they're going to talk about what we want to talk about, not what they want to talk about. So generally, when management brings demands to me at the table, I just push them to the side and talk about our demands. Uh, it's very, very important that you build a culture in your bargaining committee that they are responsible and accountable to reporting out what is happening on the table to members regularly. Those of you who might have followed the UAW negotiations, Sean Fain did this for all of us in America. He got out every Friday and basically told everybody who cared what was going on at the table and bargained in public. Uh, this is significantly more powerful when every member knows what the employer is doing. And it puts us all together as a union fighting the employer rather than uh, seeing the union as your attorney going to get the best deal for you. So this is very, very important as you're building out your contract campaigns that the bargaining committee reports out, discusses, shares as much information from the table to the members as they on a regular basis in a form of a newsletter, as a table update, as a bargaining update, a, a, in a meeting, brief stewards and have them know so that they can talk any, any way that you can build a communication system where the, what's happening at the table moves to the members, they see how horrible it is and decide to come together and take action against it. Next slide. All right, stage two. This is when you're talking. 
and you're at the table and you're in uh, generally talking about things that are that are priorities for the members that are about workplace, uh, democracy, respect, and fairness. And these are indicated in the you know classic set of union demands, grievances and just cause protections, robust safety language that keeps everybody alive and uh, not injured and not sick at work, right? This is one of the things unionized uh, workplaces are significantly safer than their non-union counterparts. Uh, respect for management, they have to talk to you in a particular way. They have to do it through channels. You know, we have all of the investigatory conversations and your your rights to have a, a representative if they call you in. This is all respecting your position as a worker, that they have made it a, an agreement with the union and with you individually, that they will behave and respect you on the job and not uh, violate any of the contractual provisions, the more robust respect that you build into your contract in a variety of things, uh, the more you can enforce it over time and put the union in a position of uh, having some power over management. Uh, and then, of course, the, the core value in unions across the country is seniority. Uh, the longer you're on the job, the bigger commitment you've made to the company, their profits are your of your doing. And uh, that is the fairest uh, thing to use to protect folks, both in terms of job security and discipline and recall and all the ways in which seniority, picking rights, bids, whatever, all of these, it's the fairest system out there. It's not, you know, it doesn't give management any opportunity to decide if they do like you or they don't like you or if you're somebody's cousin or whatever. Seniority is an easy, clean, fair system. And that's why we uh, build as many seniority protections into uh, contracts as we can. At least unfair. That's an excellent comment on <laughs> stage three, if you would. Uh, that's when you're going to introduce economics. This is, of course, where you're going to find members the most interested. It's the bottom line. They're trying to feed their families. They're trying to make their car payments. They're trying to make their housing loan. They're trying to periodically uh, have a nice vacation. So money matters. Money matters to everybody and money matters a lot. So this is where you are going to find uh, people's attention peaked. Although as you move through the early stages and if you've built a good contract action team and you've committed a lot of time to uh, explaining what's going out on the table and at the table and educating members about uh, employer behavior, stage three is the place where everybody who was kind of paying attention now really focuses their energy. Uh, pay, benefits, uh, you also have uh, time off is always a big piece. And generally when you're bargaining these elements, they're packaged together because the, the company has in its mind a certain amount of money that they're gonna give to the contract. And the union can generally assert priorities as to where that goes. Does it go into uh, retirement benefits? Does it go into increased pay? Does it lift the lower paid folks? This is something that we do at the guild. The, the new the newbies are paid incredibly low. So we focus almost all of our attention on raising the salaries and putting the money in for the uh, newest members of the union. All right, next slide. All right, this is where the fun is. Uh, if you have gotten through stages one, two, and three, you've organized a cat and you've done some collective actions, you've uh, worn buttons, you've uh, packed a bargaining session, you've uh, done lunch parking lot meetings, you've done uh, break actions at the break, you've uh, gotten your community, you've gotten some community support. Folks have come out and rallied with you. You've done a practice picket maybe. You've got all kinds of collective actions going. You're looking now in stage four to get to the point where you are making the contract campaign so uncomfortable for the employer that it is better for them to settle with you than it is to continue to have you pound them in whatever way uh, you're doing that. And for us at the Guild, 
we have escalated up to uh, striking our employers, uh, generally short-term, me I work in media sphere, newspapers and like, and short-term, highly impactful strikes at newspapers get a ton of media coverage and and uh, it really pisses the employer off. The Rochester Democrat in Rochester right now is uh, is an example of that. And we've had a lot of success in putting the employer on their heels through a short-term, highly impactful, very visible strike. Because when the people who write the news go on strike, that in itself is news. So any way in which you are in a position to uh, put the employer on their heels, create a crisis for them. And at this moment is where I think there is some expertise, if you will, in bargaining. And this is the point at which you have to chart a path for settlement to for the employer. Because ultimately, you need to help them save face. They don't want to feel as if you came with a hammer and beat them to death. They have to feel like they're doing the right thing by giving in to your demands. And so any opportunity to imagine what the path to settlement is with the employer, who the decision makers are, so on and so forth. This is the place where you've created enough crisis and you need to seal the deal. If you're out on strike, if you're th or if you have a credible strike threat, uh, or if you've done community support and, you know, attacks on the brand, you know, if you've taken on, you know, uh, Coca-Cola or Pepsi or any of the other uh, companies that have public brands and started to make it uncomfortable for them to not agree to your demands. Stage four is the place where they say to themselves, you know what, this union is just making us look bad. We need to stop this. We need to get back to the business of selling soda and we're going to settle. And this is the the funnest point in uh what you've been building for it's what stage one stage two stage three they all lead to it's all the prep everything leads to a super majority impactful collective actions that force the company to uh say yes when they want to say no next slide so we imagine this camp this campaign as a mountain we understand it uh the bargaining committee and the cat as interlinked and that they that all of the demands are put together and we build up a escalating set of collective actions that gets us to the point at which we have the peak of what is possible to organize we have the most strength that we are ever going to get and uh for us that is a short duration highly visible strike in the newspaper industry. And so we build towards that. And uh, we sort of think about timing the bargaining with the escalation so that you get to the peak of your strength with the fewest number of demands left on the table. You don't want to be at the peak of your strength when you have 20 open issues. You want to be at the peak of your strength when you are basically beating them to death over wages and benefits and maybe one or two major workplace safety issues. Uh, things like air conditioning at UPS would be an example of one where, uh, you know, this was an extremely important and was not something that would be understood as an economic demand for the union. We weren't getting more money. It was certainly a cost item for the company. So figuring out your uh, sort of sequence of escalating demands, uh, of escalating actions, connecting them to individual demands that are being fought at the table. We, uh, in the in my industry, uh, employers never want to agree to just cause. For whatever reason, they believe that they have to have unilateral ability to terminate and discipline folks and not uh, have any justification for that termination other than uh, their opinion. So we do a campaign regularly called Just Cause No Exceptions. We do entire uh, social media pushes. We get people with buttons that say Just Cause No Exception. This is in stage two at the middle of the game, but it is an important and we get our chops and we build up our muscles to do things collectively by picking important demands 
and building collective actions for those during the period that you're bargaining through the four stages so that you get to the top, which is the peak of your strength. Uh, let's look at the next slide. We frame all of these uh, using the, the labor notes thermometer, if you will, uh, to train people to understand uh, the impact of uh, actions and uh, build them over time to be more impactful. So getting together as a group, it seems like nothing, but employers notice when I used to uh, work for the transport workers union and I did a lot of airline organizing, when the baggage handlers at Southwest Airlines started to have regular union meetings on the jet bridge uh, across the entire country at a particular time on their breaks, time together, <clears throat> management went nuts. And just the fact that folks were meeting together scared them to death. And suddenly they started uh, responding to grievances and doing different, you know, different things that we needed them to do. So doing things collectively, even if they seem small at the beginning, is going to build the muscles to do more and more. So we have sort of escalating actions here that uh, turn up the heat, walking out on walking out of a meeting a mass, speaking to the media, publicity stunts, supporter meetings, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> setting deadlines on demands, information requests, all the legal unfair labor practices, <clears throat> excuse me, legal actions, newsletters. If you publish a newsletter or bargaining update, it's always gonna get to management. So that in and of themselves, they're going to understand that you are telling everybody what's going on and that their behavior is count, uh, accountable, uh, forming grievance committees, picking a particular fight, communication networks, parking lot meetings, surveys, issue surveys, health, anything that brings people together about an issue that they care a lot about that is being bargained at the table. It does two things for you. First of all, it makes the bargaining committee, which can be very consumed by a difficult task of tracking all the demands, uh, that they're supported by the membership, and it can make the membership feel like they are participating in winning the changes that they need at the job. And those two things together are what's going to put a contract campaign in a position to create a crisis for the employer force them to say yes, then they want to say no, and win the kind of demands, both benefits, uh, health, economics, uh, and democracy and workplace fairness that every one of your members wants and aspires to have when they go to work so that we feel like, uh, you know, a day at work is filled with dignity, we're respected, we're well compensated, we have enough time uh, with our families, which we are able to support, and we can sort of live a life of modest affluence without uh, fearing for our financial security every minute of every day. And that's the goal of doing this, and I'll end there. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, and I'd like to direct everyone uh, while we are going through our next speakers, if you do have a question, for Nick or any of the other speakers, you can put it in the Q&A box down at the bottom of the screen. Um, and uh, we have four speakers remaining who are gonna speak about taking this idea and strategy that Nick laid out and putting it to action. Um, so the next person we're gonna talk to is uh, Tim Tatum, a waste worker from Teamsters Local 731. Uh, so Tim, um, you know, Nick laid out in the News Guild how to bargain contracts when you have the local and the union on your side. But in your local, um, you kind of had to get started running a contract campaign uh, with the members. So how, how did you use the contract surveys to get members engaged in the contract campaign? Uh, so one of the things we knew is we knew our local wouldn't do the survey. They, uh, they've actually never done one before. Uh, they, they would just negotiate behind closed doors and take all the credit 
And so we were, we were actually done with that. Uh, so we wanted to do things a little bit differently. Uh, we, we wanted the members to actually take charge and we wanted, we wanted members to get involved. So um, we spoke to members, got a sense of what were the issues that people were talking about. And based on that, we put together about uh, 12 main, ish, main things that we knew people cared about. Uh, so, what we, so what happened was last year, we, we actually uh, ran an election campaign. And so since we did an election campaign, we had a, a ton of phone numbers. And all we did was we just started texting people and, and we took a poll and we had people vote about the things that they cared most about. And so that's what we did. We had, we had uh, surveyed the members. Great. Uh, and Tim, how did running this kind of survey get members engaged in the rest of the contract campaign and feel like they had a voice in the contract? So, so it actually helped members to feel like they actually had a voice. Um, our local was put in trusteeship during the contract fight. And so we were able to bring members to the proposal meeting uh, held by the trustees. We, we uh, printed out the results of the survey and we actually went around and we began to hand it out to everyone at the meeting and uh, we got members to actually speak out and th sometimes that's one of the hardest parts is actually getting people to speak out and so you guys if you're gonna if you're gonna run this you have to look like the real leaders and you got to take charge and ownership of this um the trustees actually didn't even like this you know and uh, but but here's the thing: they had to listen to all the members, right, who spoke, and they knew what the what the members were saying were legitimate, because it was it was backed by results of the survey, and so the end result it was that I I actually ended up being appointed by the trustees to be a member of the bargaining committee, and my voice was taken seriously because they knew uh, what what we were doing was backed up by hundreds of members. Uh, so who, who did the survey? So it does work, guys. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tim. And yeah, we were getting a lot of questions in the chat um, about uh, how do you get started on this kind of thing if you don't have the backing of your local? And I think uh, Tim and other uh, people have shown that sometimes just as members, you can get started and take action. Um, and that's also what TDU is for. If you come to this webinar, you're gonna get the recording afterward with the slides, but we also ask everyone to fill out the contract campaign uh, get involved form that we're gonna to send to people. And TDU can work directly with members to help them get started, help them write surveys, help them make materials to get their coworkers involved. Um, next up is gonna be uh, Ethan Walsmith. Ethan Walsmith is from Local 135 in Indiana and he's a worker at Coca-Cola. Um, so Ethan, you were a member of the bargaining committee in 135 for your contract this spring. How did the bargaining committee use different tactics to keep members informed during the bargaining process? Well, you know, our business agent, Jesse, he printed out a seniority list of all the members and we kind of divided that amongst the bargaining committee. And so I texted about 15 people off that list, plus all the people that I knew locally that I worked with. So I would, every time we would have a caucus, I, you know, I'd let them not know what the proposals were, what the counters became, and just kept them updated the entire time during that. Great. And I also saw that you guys would make videos and Zoom calls after the bargaining as well. So the members kind of knew what was going on during the process, right? Right. And we also, you know, kept our social media page updated too. So it was, you know, anywhere you looked, you'd see what was going on. Right. And this is uh, Ethan's first time on a bargaining committee, everyone. And when I talked to him on the phone, he was saying that he didn't know that this stuff wasn't normal in a lot of places. It just kind of seems like common sense that members should be informed of what's going on. Um, but for you, Ethan, you guys, uh, during your escalation stage that Nick talked about, uh, you guys held a practice picket demonstration to get members engaged. 
why do you think it was important to have these kind of communications with members to build them tr their trust to take part in these actions like practice pickets later on? You know, it just shows everybody what's going on exactly. And, you know, it's nobody's really going to want to strike if they don't know what we're striking for. So, you know, it, it, it keeps everybody all on the same page as far as negotiations. And it just it shows the company that we're serious about, you know, getting a just contract, you know, and I appreciate all the help with the buttons and the uh, and the signs that you help make us. You know, I think that really sent the message clear to them. And we had a really good turnout during the practice pick out to pick it too. We had about 80 plus people show up, you know, which was, you know, way more than I was expecting. So I think that really sent the message to them. Great. And like Ethan said, another thing that TDU can help with during the contract campaign, we help uh, work with the members of business agents to plan the practice picket. Uh, we also design buttons for members to wear as well. Um, so yeah, thank you, Ethan. Um, next up is going to be Omar Moreno. Omar is a UPS worker in Southern California and a member of Teamsters Local 572. Um, Omar, um, can you talk a little bit about how you got the ball rolling at UPS at Local 572 without waiting for help with your local to get members engaged? Sure, yes. Uh, yeah, in our hub, um, we began to organize early. Um, we uh, began by passing out flyers and uh, planning out educational workshops with TDU. Um, we also handed out these uh, ready to strike t-shirts and we wore them together in the hub. Um, we didn't wait for the local to help us organize. We did everything ourselves. What we also did was we uh, organized meetings at, a, at, a, at the park um, after we got out of work where we had food and drinks and we discussed our key demands and answered any questions that uh, any, any, anybody had. Um, we also organized uh, bigger meetings uh, in our hub where in our hub, there's a, it's a only one way in and one way out. So it's real visible uh, from the inside of the hub where if um, anybody is looking outside, they can see who's coming in and who's coming out. So what we did was we organized the meetings around nine o'clock where uh, the inside employees coming out and the drivers coming in, they would, uh, we would meet together and in the meetings we discussed our, uh, our key demands. We gave them updates on the negotiations and we also um, uh, took pictures. We had ready to strike signs and uh, you know, we, we let chance. So um, as the meetings got bigger and bigger, because sometimes the drivers would come in a little early and they would uh, they would just be in the hub. But as the meetings grew bigger and bigger, um, some of the drivers started coming out and joining us. So man, we noticed that management started, you know, coming out, coming out of their offices and standing at the bay doors where they uh, noticed that, you know, our group got grew bigger and bigger, and um, you know we uh, we were sending management a message that um, we demanded a, a a strong contract, and if we weren't uh, content with it, that we would uh, we were ready to strike. So the the um, you know the, the the meetings went well, and you know like I said, we sent management a, a message, and they noticed that we were serious. And if we had to strike, uh, we were ready. Great. And so for Omar, you know, I, I can tell everyone else in the audience, uh, the effect of Omar and his coworkers organizing is that Omar's building had some of the highest membership engagement during the contract campaign of any buildings in the country, just because Omar and other TDU members and coworkers took initiative to start um, getting coworkers involved. Omar, how do you think it made you and your coworkers feel to take part in these regular actions? How do you think it made people uh, feel more attached to the idea of being a union member? I think it was more of them making them uh, aware of what was going on um, because the IBT actually created an app where it would uh, give updates on the negotiations. So in some of the meetings, we would actually show them how to download the app and help them, uh, you know, 
uh, created and and uh, like some of some of the members didn't even know what local we were in, so we helped them with everything and just being consistent and and, and visible, passing out flyers, and you know just being regularly active, you know it it, it uh it gave them a, a sense of uh like solidarity. So um just being persistent and 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 not uh you know waiting for you know uh your local your business agent to organize you you know you know we're the union and you know we did the organizing and uh you know it, it uh it it gave everybody a sense of uh you know participation so just being persistent great thank you so much omar and last up is Luigi Jokai. Luigi is the vice president, uh, the United Auto Workers, Local 51 in Detroit. Um, before you talk about your campaign, Luigi, can you just uh, give people a little bit of a rundown of what happened in the Auto Workers contract campaign last year, just for the Teamsters who might not be familiar with uh, your campaign? I. Uh did you want me to start with what we did um, before the practice pickets or leading up to it kind of? Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, so with the UAW, things were, were a little different than years past. We had just had um, elections. Our president, I think, had gotten sworn in maybe six months before the contract was about to expire. So we um, they had to put together a plan pretty quickly, and it was a... Uh, we, we elected basically a reform uh, reform caucus. Uh, so it was something that uh, was brand new. We had one member, one vote, which you guys are familiar with, but this was the first time that we were able to elect our uh, top leadership at the international executive board and the regional director levels uh, individually and not through the delegate system uh, in the past. So it was a lot of, a lot of new stuff going on. Um, Sean was, was being very transparent about what was gonna take place. Uh, conversations that were being had with the companies uh, and he did something also that was that was a little different he didn't uh, do the traditional handshake with management uh, that they would do before they did uh, negotiations he actually did a membership handshake he would show up at locals and he was shaking hands with the members saying hey i want to let you know that we're, we're doing this contract for you and that's kind of what started this this contract campaign it was something a little little new for us it was out of the box and that's kind of how we got to the practice picket um watching the teamsters uh, UPS and all the other ones who were doing practice pickets, I was literally sitting there going, man, that's a great idea. Why don't we do that? And one of my union sisters from GM was like, yeah, why don't we? I'm like, that's a good idea. There's nothing, there's nothing stopping us. We should do this. And literally just from a couple of conversations between two people, it, it spread like wildfire. And we started talking to our different, uh, different locals in the area in the Stellantis or formerly Chrysler department, GM, Ford, uh, we had some Teamsters joining us. We had teachers unions. Uh, it started to spread and, and it became a really, really big conversation to the point where Sean Payne himself said, hey, I'm coming to your guys' practice picket. This is the first one in UAW history. I want to be there. And Sean showed up. Our regional director was there, uh, international staff. Uh, I mean, it was, it, was, it was the biggest thing that, that we had seen. And uh, Sean led us on a, uh, on a march, on a walk. And while we were walking, the, the neighborhood was riding by looking and saying, man, what's going on? They were honking their horns in support. Uh, we had the Teamsters driving through with their with their semi trucks actually at the same time. It just, just all happened to kind of, it, it, they were driving as we were walking and they were honking their horns. And I mean, it was, it was just great. That in turn led to a whole bunch of other actions uh, that, that took place at local levels from other members. They said, hey, we want to do a practice picket. Hey, you know what? We want to do a, a convoy. I know the Jeep drivers uh, believe from, oh man, they're gonna kill me now, uh, from uh, Toledo, I forget the local number. Um, they started a Jeep, uh, like a Jeep convoy and they came from Toledo up to Detroit. We went, we, I mean, they went all around. They, we had these convoys going through uh, the neighborhoods, going through the areas where people were on strike once it happened. And and it was just, it was just something that, that we had never seen before and we were so, uh, invigorated by it and the membership really really it, it it's something that uh i'd love to, to always see and it also 
a testament to to how the practice pick and some of the other things came. It didn't start necessarily from leadership. Um, I had just gotten sworn in as vice president at my local, so I had just had my own uh, election, and we were just members, regular regular people talking about it, and and it, it can start literally with one simple conversation. Um, a kind of a phrase I've been saying is you don't need to reinvent the wheel. We didn't come up with the idea of the practice because we just put our different version and our spin on it. So anybody out there who's thinking, hey, I got a smaller local or we haven't done anything like that, um, you can do it. It's just a conversation. And, and, you know, one person has a great idea. Two people can get a, a, some momentum. Three people can start a movement. And four people can shake up the entire world. So if you're thinking about it, just do it. Again, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Just put some fresh tires on it. Thank you so much, Luigi, and thank you so much to all the speakers. Um, and just to kind of wrap things up on uh, also a little bit on who all of us are, um, Luigi is a member of the caucus in the UAW called UAWD, Unite All Workers for Democracy. It does very similar kind of work to TDU, Teamsters for Democratic Union. These are membership-driven organizations that are helping to reform and energize unions to help members take action. Um, all of these materials presented today are put on by TDU. And if you wanna to connect to a TDU organizer like myself afterwards, please fill out our Get Involved forms that are gonna be texted or emailed out to you. Uh, and we can follow up with you and kind of help you make plans to help put these uh, plans into action. Uh, we have several Q and A's uh, that we're gonna ask to our speakers. And if while other people are speaking, you have more questions, you can text, uh, type them into the Q&A box. Um, the first question um, is for, for Nick. Um, how would you recommend to get started in assembling a contract action team? That's an excellent question. So I think uh, when you're trying to figure out who is going to be willing to step up and start engaging in leading and organizing and participating in collective actions. The real, the real place you find that is in the one-on-one -on -one conversations and small group meetings that folks have as they start talking about the contract. And so I think the way to build out a contract action team is to sort of start uh talking to with your stewards who who can say who are the people who are most likely to be active who are the people that we can ask to get engaged and to start identifying uh leaders across your uh yard your barn your uh warehouse whatever you're working in where are the leaders and trying to identify how those folks are and i would just particularly have folks look at uh, for me, what is a, a thing that we all do, which is it seems like the person who talks the most is the one who's most likely to be the leader. And that often turns out to be exactly the opposite. Uh, I think that there are a lot of quiet folks who are in a position to take leadership and organize folks together and step up. And you just have to um, pay attention to what folks are doing and the impact of their actions on a group. And that's how you see wh uh, what leaders are. And I think the last thing I would say is when I was organizing at the Transport Workers Union in buses, uh, we had large depots, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bus operators. And the best organizer in the bus depot was the person who put together the retirement parties. Uh, they were the one who knew everybody, could negotiate with management to get space. They had built relationships and connections based on trust. They were uh, engaged in developing an event on something that was important to everyone, which is retirement. And so they that immediately dovetailed into building out collective actions to fight the union, to fight the boss. So find leaders. Great. And so one thing I think um, for members out there who have never heard of a contract action team or who feel like their local isn't going to organize an official contract action team, like Omar was saying, contract action team gets started by people doing it. Um, right. If you're interested in this kind of work and you're excited about getting members involved, start talking to people. It can be informal, just asking people if they're excited about the contract and want to 
have more information and get more people involved. Um, next question is for Omar. Uh, Omar, you talked about your social events that you held in the park outside of work. Um, how did you put these events together? How did you promote it and how did you get people to attend? Um, what we did was we, um, we passed out flyers and also what we did was um, we had small meetings in the break room. So it, it was a word of mouth and it was um, not only just uh, myself and the other shop stewards, Dave Valencia, Carlos Silva, um, it, it was uh, the members, you know, the members also, you know, uh, spread the word and, you know, helped us pass out flyers. And, you know, it, it was just a, a, a participation by everyone. So uh, it, it just, you know, being persistent and, and, and just continuing to, you know, be visible and not be content with just, uh, you know, one flyer, two flyers and one meeting, two meetings. It was just organizing, organizing, organizing. Great. And next question, there's a lot of questions like this in the chat that I'm gonna direct it towards Tim. Uh, these questions, there's three or four of them like this that say, how do you run a contract campaign when you don't trust your bargaining committee? Or how do you run a contract campaign when you're worried about backroom deals? Um, what would you say for your experience, Tim, about kind of how to get started in this kind of stuff if you aren't necessarily trusting your local or bargaining committee to hold up um, their end of the bargain? Well, the thing is, is you got to get a bunch of guys that are tough and just don't care, to be honest with you, um, because that's going to happen. It's it's part of the the, the whole thing, and and uh, you got to get to the point in your mind that whatever happens happens, and you got to be leaders and you got to take charge. And if you don't do that, if you if you're going to be scared all the time and worried, then I would say don't do it. You know, you really you really got to got to know that there can be consequences, but the end result could be very rewarding. And so it's it's really up to you. You know whether you're ready to take that, that chance, but but like I said, it's very rewarding because to be honest with you, this is the best contract that we have, we've ever received, and that's because we actually stood up and took charge when others did it. So, great, thanks, Tim. And another another great tool, actually something that TDU fought hard for um, to eliminate is that. If you have your members engaged and organized and they know what they want to fight for and the local isn't going to fight for it, members can vote the contract down um, and try to push the bargaining committee to fight more for the demands. Um, next question. Um, Omar, uh, you talked about hosting educational workshops or trainings. Um, what did you discuss in these trainings? Um, and how did you work with uh, TDU to make these events happen? Well, we worked out with, with we worked with TDU and reached out to Beth and they sent us a lot of material, uh, flyers to pass out. So, um, you know, we just, uh, it, TDU helped us out a lot with uh, the information. And like William said, if, anybody out there needs information, you know, TDU is a, a great resource and they, they'll, they'll send you any information that's needed to help you organize. And so for these workshops, Omar, um, where did you hold them? Um, and what kind of information did you discuss? Um, we, we actually were able to get a facility at a city hall in Gardena, which was close to our, uh, our hub. And, uh, we uh, we had a couple of organizers from TDU come out, and we we had a some powerpoints where anybody that what was a the key issues that people wanted in the new contract. Um, we also had an educational video that we showed uh, from the '97 strike, and you know showed them how in '97, which I was part of, um, and I benefited from it because. I was able to get a full-time job where I didn't need to go driving. 
So just uh, showing them an educational video and how it was done in the past and the, the benefits of organizing and, you know, being able to go on strike if we have to. We don't want to, but that would be the last resource uh, to do. All right, great. And we're approaching the one hour mark. So we're just going to take one more question. And then again, we're going to send you all texts right after this. So please respond to that because that's how you get to talk to us one on one. Our last question is for Nick and it's about bargaining in smaller units. Um, so there's a couple questions um, and I'll ask them in a row. But the first one is, uh, is it still important to have open facing bargaining in smaller units of less than 50 people? Uh, I personally, uh, our union is characterized by units that a 50 member unit would be large. And so we have uh, units as small as four or five and a couple monster ones, you know, 1,800, 2,000 by our estimation. And I think the more transparent you are in bargaining uh, is better in the, regardless of the size of the unit. And then uh, in these smaller units, um, does there need to be a difference between the bargaining committee and the CAT team? Uh, oh, is there often overlap question. or how does that work? Yeah, it's just when if you have a unit that's very small, people do all end up doing all kinds of responsibilities. And the issue becomes sort of delegation and figuring out how to divide responsibilities and tasks. But yeah, I think that you can you have bargaining committee members and cat teams uh often being the same people. 